And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. Also, no, also known as one as one of the masterminds behind behind Lost Pages, and a, and a man of multiple time zones, <laughs> the one and only yeah. Paolo Greco. How you doing today, man? Hey, I'm good. How's yourself? I'm doing all, I'm doing all right. Um, it is it is still it is still um what could be considered sleeping weather here here in Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, but that's but that's the way it is for half the year around here, and plus I prefer it. I prefer it to summer weather, anyways. But I usually start. I usually start out with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Yeah. So, with that kind of thing in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh, uh, 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 these these dates back quite 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 a lot. Uh, I started with like uh, children adventure games. Uh, my first one was actually a Mickey Mouse stories that have been like that was published in Mickey Mouse in the eighties. Uh, it was the first Mickey Mouse children own adventure story. Uh, then from there I went to like children own adventure books. And then eventually into Tunnel and Trolls, and uh, I ran Tunnel and Trolls for some classmates in primary school. Um, ran Tunnel and Trolls because it was the only RPG with a handbook that was actually available uh, at the public library when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an Italian translation, and so uh, that's what I had. Um, from there, I picked up. Uh, the Dark Eye, it's a German RPG. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Dungeons & Dragons, and some other Italian RPGs, uh, including Catacumbas. Uh, and then, yeah, that, that's, that's the origin story. Yeah. I, would, it be fair to be, would it be fair to me to say that throughout a lot of, the t a lot of your time with RPGs that you've jumped around between different systems over the years? Oh yeah, most definitely. Like uh, in addition to the ones I mentioned before, we played uh, we play played like Cyberpunk twenty twenty, a lot of GURPS. Uh, we played Stormbringer, um, but mostly uh, we circle back to AD and D second edition mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, and uh, Red Box, the Red Box. Uh, back me. Uh, yeah, Back me was uh, had an Italian translation in the mid eighties, mm -hmm. uh, and it was like a red, like it, it was published by the same Editrice Jockey, which was the same company that had uh, that was like had was like the published the translation for Monopoly and Risk. So it, it was, it had like D&D &D in Italy was in Toy Stores. Which I think, I think for, I think for some, the idea of D&D &D in a toy store see, well, seems a bit ridiculous, but it did, but it did happen. Uh, well, it, it was there with board games. You would get, in Italy, you would get board games in toy stores. Mm -hmm. uh, so D&D &D is, after all, a board game. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No arguing that. Oh, and it's def. I think it. I think. I think a lot of people are used to the idea of it being in a ho in a dedicated hobby shop. Much like oh, how, yeah, yeah. much like how for much like how you have a whole generation of comic book readers who weren't used to the idea of comic books being on news being on newsstands. Oh yeah, totally. But that, that also like. It really depends by country. In Italy, you get a lot of like uh, translated stuff in in the newsagents. Mm -hmm. 
ask you nowadays. Um, but what? we have a massive comic book cultures culture here, so it's like the market is kind of big. Yeah. Oh, I just br I just bring the comic book thing up as a point as a point of contrast. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. So that brings that brings me to Wolfwald, which you've dis which you've described as a mythic Anglo-Saxon RPG. Yes. Um, and when it comes to that, when it comes to that particular um, that that particular culture. Um, was this a was this an area of culture and history that you always had an interest in, or was it one that was fostered by some, by something else at a at a point in the past? Um, well, uh, Lee, that is the writer, uh, was um, I think he was like always like uh, interested in it, and uh, actually like Wolfold the first. I think believe that the first edition of Wolf of Wolves published before 2011 mm -hmm. uh, for an RPG that is not D&D. &D. So, like, in about, around 2012, 2013, I approached Lee and asked him, uh, would you, like, get up for a, translate, for, a, for, a, for a different edition? He was like, yeah, sure, let, let's do this. And then, like, I had, like, some... Uh, health problems, uh, mental health problems, and I, like, the project, like, was basically in development hell for half a decade. Uh, no, more than half a decade, that's, that's unfair. <laughs> um, and, and here we are, and we're kickstarting it, and it's doing all right, it's funded, uh, we are on our way to, uh, to the first stretch goal, which is extra... Like, um, which is extra covers for the different booklets, uh, rather than having a single cover. And I think it's going to be right. Uh, by, like, right now, I think that as we are, the project is doing pretty well. Uh, the first two books are almost completely laid out. The third one is maybe halfway through. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, we are proceeding. It'll be good. Yeah, and even even within the even within other old school style games, because a lot a lot of a lot of the ones that I've seen over over the years, um, do play do play their association with whether it whether it be AD and D or something earlier, um, uh, very close to the chest. Um, yeah, with some with some reskinning of the basic four. Whereas yeah. you, whereas you guys, while you're using the framework of of um old, of old school, um, it you're definitely not going with going with that, especially with the class system that you have. Yeah, but yeah. I do think it's a bold, it's a very bold move to go with tw to have twelve classes right out of the gate. Uh, it's it's because there are four human cultures in the book, uh, and we wanted to have um, a class for, for for each of the three archetypes, which is the warrior, the skirmisher, and the wizard. We wanted to have a class from every culture, from me, for every like England, if you want. Given, uh, and, given, sorry, given that, how do you make sure to make th make it that? Each of the, each of them is distinct from each other, both in oh, crunch and. Uh, well, every um, every warrior class has uh, different effects on critical and fumbles, mm -hmm. and also the um, the equipment is going to be different because of their origin, and also uh, every single class has a different. Fighting ability that they can do, if I remember correctly, one per combat. Mm -hmm. um, so they do play different, and the fumbles and the criticals are um, like they differ as well uh, in ways that are maybe not a huge. They don't have a huge impact on the combat overall, but they are quite like flourish, like flourishy if you want. 
Um, and as for the spellcaster, um, Wolfwell doesn't have any legacy content. Every single spell or ability or magic power is made from scratch. Now, get, would it be fair of me to say that the that with the spellcasting classes, each of the, the method in which they would utilize spellcasting is going to be different, or are they going to be a, the same across the board? It's just it's just what they can cast will be. Different. Oh no, no no! It's completely completely different as well. Like um, for example, the the witch um, uh, learns power for a familiar. And the witch sacrifices some of her life force, can be their stats or hit points, to learn different magic powers. And those magic powers can be used in different ways. Uh, as in, like, the game mechanics for each one of them is different. Uh, some might even require a sacrifice of hit points every time they're used, like a permanent sacrifice of hit points or stats. Uh, but uh, some are like uh, brewing potions, some are curses, uh, some are um, uh, healing rituals, and some of these can be learned at different levels, like learned repeatedly to improve them. Mm -hmm. uh, while, for example, the, the Shining One, which is the, um, the Erdwerod um, caster, is a necromancer, and all his powers are like pertain summoning phantasms, like ghosts, the uh, vengeful and evil ghosts of the dead, uh, mm -hmm. to use their powers to scare or to become an undead, like to get the powers of the undead, or to um, what's the other one? Uh, there is another magic power that I forgot right now. And also they can create uh, Orkness, which is the, um, the proto-orc, if you want. They are this kind of like, essentially a white. Mm -hmm. um, then what's there? Uh, the Elf Spellsinger uh, has um, charms and songs of the forest, and they're all, they're all um, based different underlying mechanics and one of the different effects. Uh, so the, the four character classes are, are, in a way, much more different between any two of them than the wizard and the cleric are in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. Now, that be now given, given, that ex given that example that you mentioned with, with um, casters, um, I know that you sh on the Kickstarter page you showed the Shield Maiden. Um, yes. On it, um, I'm curious how that I'm curious how that how the approach that it has would differ from the from the other um, the other warrior archetypes that you, ha um, that you have within the book. The book is so the game framing is that um, a king of the Earth World, which are essentially the mythic Anglo Saxons. Uh, needs some expendables to get some dirty jobs done. And the best expendable are people that have been banished. And they can be from anywhere. Like, the, like the, there is no reason why a dwarf, an elf, an archwerd, and, 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 um, and, and like should ever be together, if not for the fact that they're in fact, they're in fact banned from their homeland. And they are wandering the land, having no legal rights. That's why, that's why they're called wolf heads, because they have pretty much the same, same legal rights as wolves. Um, and they decided that like, being alone is too dangerous. Mm -hmm. They are in the same circumstances. And the only way they have to regain their, like at any place in society, is to form a wolf pack and work for an Erdogan king. Because they're the only ones that are so desperate to use a wolf pack. Mm -hmm. and, and so there is this tale of like horrible people, like probably very horrible people that have been banished and they're just trying to find a place to exist. And to do that, they must do the, dirt like the dirty job for a king. Mm -hmm. 
which might be horrible stuff. And the king, the king's man, like the king's, like the peasants, the court, they all dislike the wolf pack because they come from outside their society. So there is a there is an angle of mistrust. Also, they are clearly prone to violence and and you know maybe necromancy or magic. So they are seen with like mistrust, suspicion. They are probably foreigner. They might be not like even be earthware. That's one of the reasons why the Shield Maiden exists as a class. There is no Earthworld male fighter. Is that the Earthworld male fighter is not an outcast. He's a fighter in the Shield Wall. He's a core member of his community. Mm -hmm. While in this case, the Shield Maiden just didn't deci decide that, like, not the but my place in society was not, I just didn't fit. I'm just going to leave. Or maybe she got banned for a reason. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to encounter a male earthworm fighter, like, you know, mythic Anglo-Saxon fighter is going to be probably on the opposing forces compared to the player characters. Mm -hmm. Or maybe one of the king's men. Now, with the with that in with that in mind, the other th the other thing that I saw the other thing that I saw that you're doing is a default progression that's o that's only three levels long, and you mention it being based on a design by Arneson. I'm curious why you went with that approach. Um, originally, it was, and in, no, you know, in a way, still is. It's a it's a very much an, an OD and D supplement. Uh, so uh, that's the tone that we wanted to give to the whole book. Um, that's one of the two level progressions we're going to present. The other one is going to be the traditional nine levels progression. And it's going to be uh, also available in the book. The, the nine level progression uh, is going to be, so the tables are going to be in an appendix, but there's also going to be a PDF version of the player's handbook, sorry, the, the wall set handbook, like the first, the character handbook, if you want, uh, with the laid out with a nine level progression in it rather than an appendix. So if, uh, if you want, you can just print it out and have the book printed for the system you want. Mm -hmm. So with the the other thing that I saw, the other thing that I was curious about is the um, ver is the versatile modifier. Yeah. And is that is that essentially is that essentially a stand-in for the for the equivalent of a skill modifier? Um, in a way, but like the 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 shield maiden is supposed to be in this way, you know, like it's supposed to be like. A very average fighter, like it's she's like she made us like fight in a balanced way from a game design perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but we wanted to give them this like perk that like they can assign these bonus uh, to whichever modifier they want. Like oh, this this combat I'll have I, I need more defense, so I'm gonna have fight with better armor class, or I'm gonna need more like hit roll because. There is a lot of enemies that are weak, so I can dispatch them like easily. So I just need to hit, or you know, it's we're gonna go against the big bad folks. So damage bonus. Mm -hmm. that, that's the the idea behind uh, the versatile bonus. Yeah. Now with with. The um, and sorry, the Shield Maiden also doesn't have uh, those like bizarre criticals and um, uh, and fumbles mm -hmm. um, because they are they're steady fighters. They don't they're not uh, they're not prone to you know uh, bouts of uh, I don't want to say strange behavior, but bout of like. Uh, extremes. Say, extremes, yes. Mm -hmm. 
and I, all, even even though there there is that that level of progression, the the thing I couldn't help but notice is that hit die progresses far more rapidly than it than it does in, than it does in a lot of other cases. Yes, it's because um, in the Arnazon progression system, uh, there are three levels, and they're like like just like fighter hero and superhero. And heroes have like normally four hit dice, and superheroes have eight hit dice. Mm -hmm. So they would attack four times against other fighters, or eight times as well, like in the original game. Um, but uh, yeah, that's why we, we made that essentially. Which I can I can certainly get behind. I can certainly get behind that. No. It's it's a different design. It's a different design. We wanted to do these like very old styley white box product, uh, like stark design, um, and and so we went for that. But as I said, there's going to be also like more vanilla nine level progressions in the back with, you know, nine nine levels. So you get like one in diaper level. Uh, the hit roll like um, progresses more steadily, uh, and and so on. Oh, uh, now Aid early D and D has ha has had the approach of um, of different classes having different experience thresholds. Uh -huh. so I'm curious if you ha if there's going to be a chart that you have regarding um, di regarding different archetypes and how much XP they'd need to level up, or if you have um, a different approach. No. Uh, right now, there is just like one level progression, um, and for the three level progression, uh, is uh, I think actually you get like to superhero, like to the equivalent of superhero level, like very early compared to normal DD at 32,000 experience points, as opposed to maybe 128,000 or 256,000, depending on uh, right now, I can't remember how much how many XPs the fighter needs to get to level eight. Uh, but uh, the point is that you don't get experience for fighting. You don't get experience to when, when you like ransack treasure hordes. You get only experience for um, the gifts that your lord gives to you mm -hmm. in front of his um, in front of the community. That's like. Wolfold tells us in a way the story that is made in Wolfold. I'm not saying that like that's what you're gonna do, but like the um, the, the narrative, the underlying narrative is you do the work for the king, doing horrible stuff for the king and possibly for for the community of the king, and the king shows that. You're a valuable member member of the community by giving you gifts in front of everybody and throwing blankets for you and and so on. So the the progression is more tied to this social aspect, if you want, mm -hmm. than to actually the murder home wing happening in the game. Yeah. Because don't get me wrong, uh, in a way depending on the kind of mission and the kind of campaign and you're gonna it's gonna be played uh, it, it will get pretty grisly uh, possibly yeah uh, or not maybe sometimes it's like oh my god uh, there is a dragon that might waken up next week mm -hmm. or for the solstice so other times it's like oh well, we know that like there is a band of raiders coming like hired from these other king uh, sorry, for the, by this other king, and they're coming here, so probably, like, you want to do something about it, and, and maybe, like, might even involve, like, taking revenge on the enemy of the kings, of the king, and so on. So it's, it's, it can be quite, mm -hmm. and quite varied. The way, the way wolf wolves are, dis are described within the Kickstarter page, it gives me the vibe of them being for lack of a better term, the ex um, a group of expendables, essentially, yeah. essentially they're they're there for they're there to do some sort of dirty work. But if things go south, then they're not getting any help. 
Uh, no, that they are. They're, I mean, they might get. Uh, they might be getting some help, but they are not members of the community. Mm -hmm. until they become members of the community, so they are like literally nobody cares if they die. Yeah. It's, and given yeah. given that, I'm cur I'm curious if um, if trying to run Wolfwald as a hex crawl is, has been done t in testing. Uh, no, uh, but there is no reason why it shouldn't. However, you would hex crawl as a mean to an end rather than to explore, unless the king says, like, go and find the, the lair of this, this person, or, like, go and find this person, then you would hex crawl. Uh, but it's, it's... It doesn't... The campaign, the suggested campaigns don't have the typical element of uh, let's explore the wilds and see what's there. Uh, because the adventures would be mostly based on what your lord needs. And if the lords need like a land to be explored, sure, can send the wolf back, but can also send like some scouts. <laughs> Just like a bunch of people on horses to go and have a look. Uh, also, the the land of Wolfald, like Wolfald is the name of the place mm -hmm. uh, depicted in the map, um, is is all mapped. There is there is not exploring to to be done anymore. Uh, like there are some remote reaches, but like it's it's a it's a it's a very late point of light campaign, as in that it's mostly lights. Mm -hmm. Darkness is is small. And pain. I get. I got gotcha. you. Now, as I understand it, the putting a, putting aside the map, which does which does look very ap does look very apropos. You're splitting it into four books: Wolf Heads, yeah. Magic Campaign, and Monsters. And yeah. Now, when it, now the the campaign book is one I want to focus on for the time being, since it ha since it has a short adventure, though you refer to it as a misadventure, um, the Rose War of Wi of Wigwela. Yeah. Um, what style of adventure is that is that going for? Is that is that just a, a the standard kind of adventure that you'd see that you'd see for first level, or is there a certain tone? Oh, no, no, I, I can't. Like as soon as I as I mention what. As soon as I explain anything about it, it's going to be spoiled. Um, I, I can say that it uh, it also is like a bit of silly wordplay on the War of the Roses, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's very much it's, no, it's, it's it's really wrong. It's uh, there is uh, there, there, there is like a quite a strong magic element. There is there is like. Uh, <laughs> It would be spoiling. Like the the the, the adventure starts weird. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really not your typical, uh, you know, small dungeon, rats, sacks, copper coins, balls. Sorry, ten foot ball kind of stuff. It's 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 you're you're a wolf pack. You go and. Like in in these like ports, and there might be fights, and there is strange things. Uh, it's <laughs> I'm really sorry. Like it will it will be spoiling. It will be spoiling, and I don't and I don't want to. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, when it comes. To I know I had, we had spoken about about magic being used differently, but there's one other aspect that I did want to touch on, and that's whether or not the whole spell charges and spells per day um, f format is getting use, or if you have something else in mind with the caster um, armor. Uh, um, not mostly. They are... Um... Uh, one second. Well, it really actually depends on um, the class. 
because some uh, some um, some classes have like limited users. Some other classes have to pay a price. So it would be um, it, it doesn't use spell slots mm -hmm. essentially. Um, there is, for example, like um, there is a, a rite that the, the witch can do, and it's brewing the um, the nine herbs charm, which is actually like a, a, a real Anglo-Saxon spell that was used in the real world, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's the kind of like a sort of a panacea, all healing brew, and every time they use it, they have to pay the price. So basically either sacrifice a stat point or a hit point, and also they can use it most, at most nine times in their entire life. But for example, the Elf Spellsinger um, can change ship once a day for, uh, per, for every level. Mm -hmm. uh, so like every power, every class has different mechanics. Um, and yeah. All right, I and I I can certainly go with that. Now, one of the other th one of the other um, aspects that I'm that I'm curious about is in re is in regard to ma to um to the monsters because. A tricky thing that can happen, especially with people who have a good amount of experience with D and D in gen, with D and D in general, and with old school D and D in particular, is making so that the monsters aren't aren't going to be as. I was going to say predictable, but that's not the right word. But just that they won't be able to telegraph the monsters, and mm -hmm. given how a lot, given how a lot of these. A lot of the um, entries on the player-facing side are not are not the typical affair. I'm curious if the same applies to the monster list that you have, where they're not exactly the um, monsters that one might expect in the monsters manual. Uh, yeah. Um, well, like for example, like I want to bring up the dragons and the giants. Uh, there are, if I remember correctly, seven dragons in the book. They're all like different. They're all different, as in like they are seven. They're not seven races of dragons. Mm -hmm. There are seven dragons. They all, they all have different personalities. They all are, they look very different. They fight in different ways. As in like their combat tactics are just different. Um, and same for the giants. Uh, there are only seven giants left in the world. Uh, all the others have died off. Um, and they are just, you know, these very tall blocks going around, um, eating stuff most of the time. Um, they have like different stats. They again fight different. And and as for the other monsters, um, there is going to be. It's a it's a self-contained game, and it's not a game you played before. Um, there are no orcs or goblins. I mean, there are orcs, but they are not orcs. Um, and the in the beginning, when you fight them, you have no idea what they are. But eventually, you will start to get like a measure of them. And I believe that's totally part of the game experience. Like, get to know the measure of your opponents. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they are. They are. They are. They are they're gonna be different. They're gonna be different. They're gonna be um, very. In a way, in a way, Wolfwald is not Dungeons and Dragons. Like, as in, it's not Greyhawk or Blackmoor or Forgotten Realms. Mm -hmm. Those all have an ad, like Dungeons and Dragons elements in them, but Wolfwald doesn't. The Mechanical setting elements, so for example, the classes, the spells, the magic items, the monsters, they're just not there. Mm. Like, Wolfwald is not even a place that really has dungeons. Yeah, and 
the main reason that the main reason that I ask that kind of thing is I think it's important to make it to make it clear that the familiarity that one might have e even with uh, even with um AD and D or B or BX or OSE or what or what have you does n is not going to be as universally applicable to to this case. Uh, well, yes. However, there is also the fact that you can just like blend the content as much as you want. Uh, with uh, nothing stops you from uh, taking the nine level version of the Wufel classes with their spells and toss them in a normal daily campaign. They are designed to be. It's designed to be interoperable. So if you want to play a wizard in Wolfwell, you're totally fine. Like a wizard is going to be as an outcast as any of the other wolf heads. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's the kind, in a way, the kind of game is is probably like not as dungeon. I don't want to say focus because this D and D doesn't have to be dungeon focused, but like it's it's an element that is probably not going to be there, so it, it's going to be a different experience. And in a way, it's what we wanted to do. Like we said, like hey, why don't we make something that is just different rather than more of like another clone? We didn't want to make another clone. We wanted to make the thing. There are enough clones, I think. Now, with that with that in mind, what do you what did you have in mind as far as the page count for each of each of the four books? So the page count for uh, one second for you actually had to split uh, book one and book two into different books uh, because um, uh, because it was it was getting too big for uh, stable, like to be stable bound. We have like booklets. We have to go perfect, but perfect doesn't lie flat, and also it looks different from the idea of white box edition I have in my head. Um, uh, and so book one should be around forty something pages, maybe fifty. Uh, book two. Um, Again, maybe 50, uh, and book three and four, to be honest, I have no idea, but I think that the page count for book three is, again, going to be 50, and book four is going to be pushing possibly 60-something. I think in book four, we're going to put as much stuff as we need, uh, as we can. Um, there is also an option, like there is a stretch goal that is not being revealed yet, but at this point, like, I'm not sure if it's going to be hit. And it's going to be an extra PDF uh, or even printed book um, with more monsters. Uh, but rather than being monsters, monsters, it's um, stats and description for all the human folk. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, um, and it, it just wouldn't fit in the 64 pages because above the 64 pages you can't really do a staple bond, a staple bond book. It's just like it doesn't really work. Yeah. Now, I know you said I know you said that you're not that you're not doing any plus one swords, but I'm curious what you have in mind when it comes to alternative rewards that a, um, that a lord might get that a lord might give the party well in addition to like magic items um the um uh, like for example like there is a there's a magic harp it is a truth telling liar and it's a liar it's a it's a harp with seven strings uh with draconic design golden strings and so on and if it's like tuned correctly um, every time a lie is uttered in the presence of the harp, 
the harp will sing the word lies. Uh, and it's also, it's, it's a great instrument. Uh, and, you know, if highly, for example, like charismatic or like whatever, like if any of the characters has some to play the harp, uh, maybe the king, like their lord, would be uh, willing to give them the harp as a reward. But maybe, like, a reward could be a falcon. A reward could be, like, a banquet in the honor of the players. A reward could be uh, good weapons and armors. Uh, there, there is actually a list uh, of rewards in the player's handbook. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the experience points for it. Uh, so, for example... Uh, a magic weapon could be 10,000 experience points. Or a, a falcon could be 3,500. And the broadsword is 1,000. Mm. Because swords were, uh, were kind of expensive back then. <laughs> uh, the, the reason why spears and axes uh, were uh, common weapons uh, at that point in time was because they are way easier to forge than swords. Mm -hmm. Plus, that, plus... I'd, I'd imagine that I'd imagine that most things that are going to use that amount of metal and that amount of craftsmanship ain't going to come cheap. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, like, for example, like the 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 the, the experience for like um, some fine food and drink in the Hall of the Lord is twenty five experience points, mm -hmm. but a banquet in your honor is seven hundred and fifty. So seven hundred and fifty experience points. With these like kind of like short experience progression is a lot. Mm -hmm. And taking that taking that into uh, into account into account, um, so there have been in some game in some games the idea the idea of at of at a certain point being able to get um fo being able to get followers or hirelings. Is, cer is certainly something that's been explored there. and of course there's been the whole end game prospect um talked to talked about in early D D, but never fully explored uh, is that is that a possibility well in the game doesn't really explore that uh as in like you will not have the rules that you have in back me for example where there is a fairly structured what happens at level nine thing right uh, or you want to have the hiring rules in uh, that you have in AD&D, mm -hmm. where, for example, the ranger takes you know a tiger and a panther and ten uh, sprites. Um, the wolf pack is the wolf pack is hardly, most probably, gonna get followers from the community they are. Hosted from maybe they are, but maybe I don't know. It's 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 not something that we um, that we actually put in the game. As for becoming lords, uh, it's mentioned, but there are no hard and fast rules for it. Maybe it's like taking over a lord in, in a difficult time. That uh, maybe you bring the difficult times. Who knows? And the other, the other thing that I'm, the other thing I'm curious about, if this is a possibility within the setting, is multiple, lo, multiple um, lords, um, utilizing, us, utilizing wolf packs, i.e., that the actions that one, the actions that one lord's wolf pack does could end up angering another, could end up angering another lord. Oh uh, yeah. Um, there is a soft assumption that the wolf pack is one. Uh, there could be like there are other wolf heads around, um, but uh, again, it's a soft assumption that there is only one wolf pack. There could be more, mm -hmm. um, but you wouldn't. But it, it, it's not the let's say the default assumption, if you want. But again, it's it's a soft thing. Sorry, I don't want to repeat myself. Like it's. Um, even if I've done it three times, um, it's uh, it's possible, but not mandatory. Makes which makes sense. Now, 
with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a hard date, but a general window. Uh, okay, so um, uh, last year we uh, we did the Book of Gold, uh, and we managed to go to press. We funded the book mid-August. We went to press mid-September, and the book started being delivered in October and shipped in late October. Um, to the US, it took a bit longer because of customs, and just the boat takes a while to go across the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, Wolfpack is going to be made in most probably either in the Baltic re republics or in China, depending on current geopolitical shenanigans. And, um, and the active development time is scheduled to be seven months. And we added uh, six more months <laughs> of Slack. Mm -hmm. So the, the date in the Kickstarter basically means if things take as, twice as much as we expect, we're going to deliver in a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and things taking twice as much as we expect is possibly not unrealistic. It's... Uh, this year is going to be more complicated compared to last year, uh, and we don't like there is much uncertainty. I probably will not start the Kickstarter <laughs> if I don't uh, a country got invaded in Eastern Europe. <laughs> and I will, regardless, I will certainly be keeping a close eye on how things develop. But uh, with with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to brave the hell of time zones and come all the way up to my temple to enjoy. To oh no, thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Awesome, I will. As I often say around Good here, time. drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Excellent. I shall. And of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.